it's all about respect and trust and transparency and not yep. looking to manipulate or take advantage of folks. I mean, comp plans should not have safety nets built in at the expense of reps that when you're not making a number, you can claim a windfall clause or claim a territory switch or what have you to avoid paying out a deal to then take that money to the bottom line to then inflate your numbers to investors in your board. It's a house of cards that you're playing with like that. So the first thing I would say is have basic trust, mutual respect, and be real with it. Today, Dan Goodman with Dan Goodman Employment Advisory joins us on the Systematic Selling Podcast. I started following Dan on LinkedIn a couple months ago because of the compelling, heart-wrenching stories he shared about high-performing sales reps getting let go by employers who didn't want to pay the enormous commission or bonus. Dan helps those jilted sales reps navigate the shark-filled waters to reclaim the compensation they've earned and deserved. Now, my clients at Systematic Selling and many of you in this audience are founders and employers. Others of you are sales reps. I invited Dan to join us today to talk about factors to consider to setting up sales rep compensation for success for both the company and the rep. What are the compensation pitfalls to avoid? The bottom line, we're going to discuss what you as the founder can do to create a culture of trust regarding sales compensation. So without further ado, Dan, welcome to the pod. Sean, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me on. Well, I appreciate you joining us. Now, Dan, did I miss anything important or get anything wrong in that introduction? No, I'm sure we'll dive into a lot more, but that was a great introduction. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, today we're going to talk about sales compensation pitfalls to avoid. But before we do, I'd like our audience to get to know you a little better. I'm curious, you're based out of Boston right now. Is that correct? That is correct. Diehard awesome. Boston sports fan. Been here my whole life. Ah, so you anticipate my next question. So you grew up there and, and have stayed there since, huh? Yes. So though now that I'm getting older, I am thinking about going down south in the winter at some point, but haven't pulled the trigger yet. Well, I'm down here in Orlando, Florida awaits. So you're always welcome to join us here. Thank you. Thank except, you. Except this time of year, you're much better off where you are. <laughs> Well, I was thinking six months in one location, six months in another. Yeah. Well, you know, you are currently doing a lot of work in employment advisory. And I'm curious from your childhood, you know, going through school and then through college, was there an indication to you that you wanted to be an advocate for employees? What What, what was it? that you saw as your vision at that time that has sparked you towards the direction you've taken? I mean, to tell you the truth, I think since I came out of the womb, this has really been my calling. I have always been someone who questioned things, wanted to know why things were done a certain way. You know, as you know, your parents would always tell you, you know, because, you know, because we're your parents, because we said so. Yeah, that never yeah. worked with me. So, you know, throughout my life, it's just I've I've seen, you know, injustices. I've seen mm -hmm. people treated poorly and people by nature have been raised to not question things, not call things out. And yeah. I have just been wired to be the, the, the opposite. And it's empowering for people to stand up to wrongdoing and call it out. And it's something that I have always done since a young child, whether it's just questioning why someone got treated differently than someone else. You know, nepotism, favoritism, you know, we see that every day in life in every aspect. And sadly, it plays a big role in the corporate world as well. You know, I, I look at the world where there's two types of people. There are rule followers and rule challengers. <laughs> and a big challenge is that whichever one you are, you think everyone should be that way. And the way I look at the world, I go, you know what, you, you need a... I need some equilibrium. It doesn't have to be equal, equal. You got to have people that are like, yeah, we want to be a cohesive team. We'll follow these rules. But you also have to have people going, hey, wait a minute. Are we following the right rules? 
Yeah. And too often, especially as 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 you build a company and build a culture, you start valuing cohesion at the expense of allowing diversity of thought and challenge to to provide a check and balance to ensure that you're headed in the right direction. So I imagine that you being wired as a rule challenger that in your in your career you've you've experienced the management coming up to you and going, hey, why do you have to be so negative? Why do you, you know, and and a lot of times management can treat you in punitive ways simply because you've questioned what they're saying. What was your experience with that? I mean, I've just seen it all the way through, whether it's my personal experience or working with all of my clients that are that are kind of dealing with these things. You know, there's a, there's a lot of gaslighting. There's a lot of bullying and intimidating. You know, it's like mm -hmm. they, I mean, the number of people that I have worked with that have been told me that they were terminated because they questioned something, because they offered a different alternative way of doing something that may have been better for the company. A lot of times yeah. these leaders are comfortable and they've been in place for a while and they, they look at the new blood coming in as, as change and a challenge yeah. to them. And yeah. people need to be open to change. They need to be uh, willing to listen to other people's views and opinions. That's what makes diversity wonderful and makes us all better. And it's shocking to me how so many leaders don't want to hear opinions from some of their underlings because they think that they know it all. So I would suggest that, you know, value your people, respect them. You know, we're all people. We all put our pants on one leg at a time. And it's the the richness of all of our collective experiences that makes it wonderful. I imagine also you talk about how leaders won't solicit or appreciate the opinions of those who are under them. I imagine there's a two-sided coin there. One, they may come across as projecting that they know it all. I'm wondering also if it might be that there's actually a fear of being exposed that they don't. Is that something that you've seen your own experience and observations out there? Well, absolutely, especially in in sort of middle management. They, you know, they they could have an underling or you know perhaps as a manager who was a peer to someone and was just you know promoted, and that's that the, the you know they're they're threatened by them. You know, the, 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 the underlay may, you know, be well, well, may, they may be more well liked or perceived in the organization. Mm -hmm. They may be more knowledgeable about certain things. They may have been in the organization longer and looked up to. And yeah. rather than embracing that person and using them to help you move along, oftentimes they, they look at them as a threat and make their life miserable. Oftentimes, you know, if the manager didn't hire you, they feel that the employee is not loyal to you and therefore won't go through a wall for you. And oftentimes when a new leader comes in, they don't give the employee a chance to succeed with them. They just, yeah. by default, just automatically want their own people. And that happens so much. Almost every time that I'm working with a client, you know, they come into a company and things are going well for a while. And it's always that one moment where it changed. And I'd say four out of five times, that moment is when there's a new leader that came in and the guy who brought you in is no longer there. So you lost your champion and now that person who came in wants to bring in their new people to things their way. Yep. Yep. And they don't give you a chance. And, uh, you know, for certain folks in a protected class based on age and other things, they mm -hmm. are entitled to that job and the employer needs to justify the termination. And it's yeah. not just because favoritism, you know, it, there has to be a legitimate reason for it. I'd like to dig deeper into your career, but before we do that, you mentioned something earlier that, as you were growing up, pretty much from the womb, you you had this sense of wanting to push back against injustice to question why things were the way they were. Is there a a pivotal moment or story that comes to mind that's really ingrained that idea? I mean, I think part of it might be being a third, a third, part of it might be a third kid growing up. That's always you know, the, thir the third son and then having the daughter be the fourth one. You can kind of imagine what that, that was kind of like. But yeah. to tell you the truth, I mean, I've always been around strong, empowering, powered women. My, my mother recently stopped working at the age of 91 as a dietitian nice. nutritionist. 
And back in the day, women did not have jobs. They were at home. And uh, she kind of broke that mold. My wife could not be a stronger person. She has been a rock star sales rep for 30 years. And frankly, on a professional level, I mean, she's sort of been the inspiration um, for this whole business. I have helped her for 25, 30 years identify and recover pay errors to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars. I have helped her stand up and negotiate for herself. I mean, people in general, they're, they can be great advocates for others, but oftentimes not so much for themselves. So that's been kind of the, the driving thing there is, is that, you know, don't be taken advantage of, you know, question mm-hmm. everything. I mean, what yeah. I have found in society is that we have all been brainwashed to think a certain way, that we yeah. put these leaders on a pedestal. There's good and bad in every walk of society. So whether it's a doctor, a lawyer, a religious figure, an employer, we can't just blindly trust that everything they do will be fair and right. Because like I said, there's good and bad in every walk. So if you look at that through that lens, you'll be protecting yourself and not be, you know, not be surprised when horrible things happen rather than being pleasantly surprised when good things do. That makes a ton of sense. Now, when you, when, when you started Dan Goodman Employment Advisory, I believe beforehand, you started a SaaS software company that dealt with sales rep compensation and true commission. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And and is that, are, are you still running that company? Is that uh, a product you're still selling? So right now I've been, I've really focused all of my efforts on uh, the uh, Dan Goodman Employment Advisory. It's been the most gratifying work of my lifetime. The impact is so significant and real. You know, I, I, I created True Commission because my first passion really was about verifying commission pay, to be able yeah. to validate that you're paid fully and accurately and not have that unknown and angst to wonder, you know, am I being screwed over here? You know, a lot of yeah. times that employers deny access to data to verify pay. And it leaves mm-hmm. employees wondering and questioning, and it it, uh, it leads to a break of trust. Um, yes. So I wanted to do is is to avoid this, uh, avoid this anxiety. Unfortunately, what folks need to do when verifying pay is to really look at what you expected to earn when you initially got that deal, and then yeah. compare it to what you actually got paid when you got paid on the deal. And oftentimes yeah. that number changes. But I'm not aware of an employer in the country or in the world that actually reports from that initial deal closing to the the payment and invoicing to the client and payment of the commission. It's always just, you know, it's hidden. Um, All they show is one side of the equation. Um, Only what was invoiced to the customer, not what the customer initially agreed to. So in order to check it in oftentimes these situations, it's a very menial, manual, brutal process of cross-referencing data sets in two separate systems and then comparing the two. So yeah. I, I, you know, I wanted to bring bring a solution to the sales folks so that they didn't have to just rely on blind faith and trust, that they could have assurances that they were being paid fully and accurately. And what does that say to an organization when a rep finds out that, hey, you know, I did these, you know, you know, 212 deals in the last three months and I was paid correctly on every single one of them. The loyalty yeah. that it brings, you know, yeah. and, and, and the trust that it brings. So, you know, right now, you know, True Commission is an app that's out there. It's, it was a free app for people to use. You know, didn't get as much engagement as I would have liked. I think people are naturally hesitant to question things. And that's what that's kind of what we found that's out. exactly what it you is. Know? So I expanded, you know, as a way to promote True Commission. It's really, it's a fantastic story. I started promoting uh, myself and what I'm doing on LinkedIn. I had never yeah. used social media in my life. Yeah. I hated it with a passion. It was yeah. all about people bragging about what they don't really don't really have to make people jealous of themselves, <laughs> uh, yeah. and and it, it just it it was it was it's wrong. And I I never was involved with it, never posted. And I said, you know what? In order for this true commission thing to really have a chance, I need to make people aware of it. I didn't raise any money. I didn't take any salary. I wasn't charging mm-hmm. anything for it. And it just felt like it was it was it was stuck. So I started yeah. posting on LinkedIn. My third post ever got one hundred twenty eight thousand impressions, and I didn't even know what an impression was at the time. Wow. So then I, so fast forward three months and I started posting about different topics that I thought I was knowledgeable about and I, you know, had an edge about. So I posted about severance and what it's about. It got 400,000 impressions and I had like 20 people reach out to me to plead with me to review their severance and they'd pay me to do it. So I did that for like six months for free for people because, you know, I, you know, I'm just starting off and I want to make sure I'm adding value. I want to have a good reputation. Yeah. Yeah. Do it the right way. So, you know, and then all of a sudden I had a call on February 1st of last year 
some guy from Israel is asking for some business questions. Some uh, U.S. company approached him about starting a U.S. office, yeah. a, 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 an office in Israel, a subsidy for for a, subsidi a, sub a subsidiary for them, just yeah. to kind of you know see what see what happens. So I spoke to him. I said I reviewed the contract. I said what you've got here is there's no protections for you. You can literally blow this thing out, create this massive opportunity, and then after one year they terminate you, and you've now just created this massive opportunity for them. I said, what yeah. you want to do is have certain KPIs that will kick in, that, that this will, that will happen once you achieve these, that you will automatically, you know, have a joint venture created that you're a fifty percent owner of since you created yeah. all the value. He yeah. loved it. He thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. He said, "That's great, Dan. How much do I owe you?" I said, uh, "I'm not really charging anybody for this right now." He says, "What? Wow." He called me some name in Hebrew. I said, "What did you just call me?" He said, <laughs> "He laughed. He says it again. He says you're a sucker." I said, what do you Man. mean I'm a sucker? I just gave you all this great advice. Yeah. And, 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 and now you're calling me names. He says, exactly. You're making my point. Anyway, to make a long story short, because that was a little long. I, from that moment on, I started charging people that very next day. And I have yeah. had more than 1,100 paid clients in 16 months doing this employee advocacy business since. So it's, it's a wild story. 100%. And I want to hit the pause button there just to reinforce this to our audience. Y'all, what? Dan just gave us is a perfect example of a go-to-market strategy that I have seen over and over again that works. You go someplace where your prospective clients, your, your ideal client customer profile is, and you hang out with them and you start sharing your expertise sharing it for free. I, yep. I call it the open mic marketing method. You're showing up, you're showing your talents and it's a low risk environment for all stakeholders involved. And they see what you can do. They will come to you and you'll start getting those requests. And Dan, that was a perfect example of how you did that. Now, Question Let me just add you. to that for one second. Yeah. Let me just add one, one comment to that. Yeah. This one of the things that I've never thought of and never believed in was always keeping the gold close to the vest. Never give it away. Just give them enough to interest them, to pique their interest, and then hopefully they'll come. Yeah. So I, I, I struggle with that for a while. And what I've come to learn is literally give it all away. Give a hundred yeah. percent of your value away. And that all that will do is create subject matter expertise perception in the marketplace and yes. people will now be drawn to you rather than having you pitch slap them and try to lure them to you. It's been the most powerful, incredible thing that I have experienced. I come out, I post every day, twice a day, and I engage in all the content and most I am just inundated with people who are appreciative, who are grateful. I have 10 to 15 leads coming in every single day, seven days a week for this advocacy practice, just by giving it away and posting the information. Guys, listen to that. That, that is everything that we talk about and want to reinforce with systematic selling. Cause Dan, the goal of systematic selling is, is, is what we call building impeccable trust. And what that means is you build such impeccable trust with your clients that they will beg to buy whatever you're willing to sell them. And what you've done there is a perfect example of what that means. Impeccable trust. You gave out information. You were adding value. You were not withholding or let me put it this way. The proper word isn't withholding. You weren't luring people into some sort of funnel where they have to pay to play. You were building these relationships. You were adding value to the point that the dam broke. There was all this reciprocal pressure pushing against the dam because you were giving so much and filling it so much that the pressure broke the dam and now getting 15 to 20 leads 
right now you're a single person practice or you have a small team? No, I've got, I'm actually, I'm going to be announcing some folks recently. I've got, uh, my mini me, I, I, I could not be more blessed with this person. Nice. We, we couldn't compliment each other more. He was literally made to do this business and yeah. he, he allowed incredible organizational skills. My wife is also working in the business, running the back end. And then we've also had some other folks that have helped us out as well at at various stages. So, yeah, I mean, at this point, I I couldn't do it myself. You know, like I said, I've had 1,100 clients in this time period. We're probably working with 50, 60 active severance negotiations right now. And we've created an amazing system that allows us to give unlimited access to our clients right now of whatever they need from us. You know, at some point, as we scale more and more, I'm not sure how we'll be able to do that, but... Everyone is fully satisfied and gets as much time and and interface with us as they need as they're working through these issues. Excellent. Now your business model, I think I read somewhere on LinkedIn, you started out charging a fee for the project, but then you moved to a contingency model. Is that accurate or what, what is your, what is your current model? Yeah. So, I mean, as I was doing this, you know, I'm figuring out as I go along as we're starting, it's a, you know, it's a brand new business. It's a brand new model. I mean, it's, 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 it's a whole, you know, I'm not aware of anything that exists like this. So yeah. I was just starting off, you know, you know, charging folks an hourly consult rate and providing some guidance, just kind of just talking off the top of my head about the challenges they face and giving them suggestions on how to move forward. Yeah. So I had two clients. They were both CROs and they were, you know, working with me and giving, you know, paying me an hourly rate. The first one increased their severance by $370,000. Mm-hmm. And I got like $1,400 out of it. And I'm like, hmm. <laughs> This doesn't quite seem right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then the next guy who was happening at the same exact time increased their offer by $65,000 and I got $1,100 out of it. And I'm like, yeah. hmm. So then a, one of my, a good buddy of mine, Scott Lease, he was an advisor, he's someone who's always kind of uh, looking out for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I think he had heard from uh, one of the CROs I worked with who he's friendly with about the great success he had. And in, in Scott's special way, reaches out to me and says, Dan, you need to start charging a contingency immediately. And I was already wow. thinking about that for about two, three, four weeks. And it was just needed that nudge to pull the trigger. So right now what I do is I charge a one-time flat fee based on pretty much your base salary because I want to try to make it as affordable for everyone as I can. So we yeah. work with folks who make fifty or $60,000 a year. And we work with folks who make four, five, six hundred thousand $600,000 a year. Right. And then what we do is that if you come to us and you have a severance, whatever you're offered... You keep 100% of that, and yep. whatever extra we help you get, we take 15% off the top right now. That, that pricing has been in place now for, I don't know, a good eight, nine months. We may be making some adjustments to that right now because we're getting an incredible number of people in. Um, I've had 45 people sign up for this contingency in the last 24 days alone. Wow. And that's the full that... contingency process. That's just not yeah. like a, a, a 15, 30, 60-minute consult. So it is really, it's taken off, it's, it's reached an inflection point. It, it's, it's, it's like trying to stay in front of an avalanche going down a hill, you know? Yeah. So I'm very, very fortunate. Let me hit the pause button again there for our audience. That right there, what Dan was describing is a way that you know that you have achieved product market fit with a product or service. So... You may have figured it out with whatever services that you're offering now, but as, as you start thinking about new services, how do you know you got that product market fit? Dan just described it. You cannot contain the demand and he did it not only with what the actual service does, but he did it with the business model that aligns both the interests of the client and his own interests. So now that they're, they are both winning. Dan was getting paid before, but now he is, he is in that situation where, Hey, the bigger win that he can help create, he wins too. All stakeholders win. So absolutely. They, they, they love it. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, no, I've, I mean, since I started doing the change, the contingency model that we spoke about, I've yeah. helped folks increase their severance offer by almost three point two million dollars in the last twelve months since I made that change. That's great, and that just, that's a great metric to be able to uh, to work off of. Yeah, and fo- I mean, folks are experiencing literally 
3,500, 4,500% ROI increases through the engagement. It's I make sure it's a win-win for everybody. It's, yeah. it's not about me winning. It's about helping people be, in, be put in a good position to be able to put these situations behind them, negotiate fair and equitable separate agreements, and, 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 and move forward feeling good about themselves, capturing back who they were. Oftentimes, they're beaten down mentally, gaslit, lied to, stolen from, mistreated, and they're a shell of them former selves. And it's uh, as, as important as, as, as the money or even more so, it's helping them get back who they were and reminding them of the great things they've done. And that being in these toxic work environments is not a reflection on them, but the people they work for. And that, you know, it, it help them capture that so that they can move forward and go get that next job. Yeah. I want to reinforce this again. So I apologize for these, these little pauses here, but it, you're providing a ton of value now for our audience. And what I want to say is what Dan is describing here is something that you can implement in your sales or teach your sales rep. What he's talking about is the transformation in the client. He is talking about, you know, when you answer the question, what do you sell? It's not the product or service that you sell. It's not the quote unquote feature or even the benefit. What you ultimately sell is an emotion and the transformation from a negative pain emotion to a positive emotion, a dopamine hit emotion, yep. something that gives them hope and confidence and everything else. So think about that as you're, as you're designing how you talk about what you do, get in your clients' heads and hearts to figure out what is it that transformation emotionally that you're delivering that you can then begin communicating because Dan is communicating that spot on. It's a core part of his messaging. So, all right, let's hit the play button again here. And thank you, and Sean. Is, thank you. Now I completely got wrapped up in that thought and I lost my train of thought in, in terms of the direction I wanted to go. So here, here's what I'm curious about. What, first off, this was the thought I was thinking with your contingency business model, you mentioned there was a fee as well. So that's a kind of a client onboarding fee to take care of certain expenses and so forth. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we, we put, we put a lot, a lot of time in, okay. we, 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 we are with the client from start to finish. The client determines when they're done, either they're satisfied with the outcome or they have had enough and they say uncle. So that, that gets you access to me, my team, our resources, our materials, you know, examples of great documents that are anonymized that have had great success. And yeah. we're, 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 we're in your corner where your advisor, your consultant, your coach in your back pocket, and you have as much access to us as you need until you're fully satisfied. And so you scale that as a percentage of what their annual salary is. So they can, you know, it'd be something that would be affordable depending on the salary range. Exactly. I mean, yeah. I mean, the, the folks in the higher end think that we're charging way too little and the <laughs> folks in the lower end are, are appreciative that there's somebody out there who can help them. You know, yeah. we, we, I do. It's not about a money grab for me. It's about empowering people to stand up to wrongdoing and be able to put this behind them and have a different lens and perspective that they look think through things for. That that's like I said before, society has been to not challenge and question things, and I am here trying to encourage people to look at it through a different lens. In a moment, I want to talk about how we can, how founders can set up their sales compensation plans for success. But before I do. What led you to become a founder? I believe you had a consulting firm beforehand and so forth. So you've kind of gone in and out of the entrepreneur market, or did you? If, if you can describe a little bit about yeah. your career trajectory. Yeah, I mean, it's always been my passion, man. I, I've always wanted to do my own thing. I'm one of these people that's either always on or not. There's no in between. So mm -hmm. when I was in corporate America, I'd come in, I'd blow it out the first year, I'd be a rock star, I'd get all this praise and reward. And I noticed yeah. the slacker who did nothing got a 2% raise and I got a 5% raise, or he got a 3% right. raise and I got a 5 And it's just, 
there wasn't a correlation between yeah. work and effort. And I, I just, I'm either all in or not, like I said, and it just, it, it's like people just wouldn't want to keep up or pace. And it was just always a frustration everywhere I went. Yeah. And I had these expectations that others would have the same commitment and the same desiring that I did. And it, it usually wasn't the case. So yeah. I always wanted to do my own thing. I always wanted to run as hard as I ever wanted and love what I do. Mm-hmm. And then just kind of create, create a business where I'm my own boss. And I'm not looking around and, you know, seeing, you know, how others are being treated. And if I'm being treated fairly, uh, yep. I'm, I'm leading, leading the way and, 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 you know, treating others fairly is, is kind of what, what, what was the driver. So I, I got an MBA in entrepreneurship from Babson College and that kind of, you know, doing all these case studies and kind of learning about entrepreneurship and how to go about it. And it, it could never be easier. I mean, I always yeah. wanted to do this 20 years ago, but I didn't know how to do it. I mean, it was expensive. Uh-huh. I mean, LinkedIn and social media and technology have leveled the playing field for everybody. I mean, it's like a complete no brainer at this point to try. You know what I'm saying? It really is. I remember the days when I launched a dot com startup in the late 90s. I mean, we had to raise angel money just to build a website. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and not just the website, the website mock-up, yeah. you know, so much, the tools that we have available today to be able to get our voice out is, is, is just phenomenal. We live in a, just an amazing time now. I mean, I mean, I mean, Sean, I'll give you an example, right? Yeah. Because I post on LinkedIn every day, I wake up the next morning and I see six or seven or eight. The other day, I had 11 paid calls booked on my calendar that just showed up, all done in the background with me doing nothing other than posting on LinkedIn, literally. Yeah. Yeah. That's, (laughs) I I remember the promise back in the 90s. You probably remember this as well when the internet came and, hey, this is a 24-7 sales rep working for you. Yeah, and yeah. now, now you've you're seeing that come to fruition in 2024, and 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 I love hearing that. That's inspiring for a lot of folks. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that, that when the internet came on. I I remember with it, there was no, there was no browser. There there was there was no GUI interface. And I remember I was working at a company, and uh, all the leaders uh, got together, and we were talking uh, about application uses for yeah. this supposed thing called the internet. And I remember we were brainstorming about ideas. And can you yeah. ever imagine every single aspect of the world is on the internet right now, going back when it first started, about, oh, yeah. no one would ever do that. Oh, that's silly. Oh, we have something like this now. It's it's amazing where it's gone to. It, it, it really is. Now, what I want to do now is, is start unpacking from a founder's perspective what they need to do to set up their compensation plan before they make offers, especially to their initial sales reps, but also to keep in mind moving forward, wherever they are in their business, to develop these plans and to hold true to those plans to ensure that fewer people are in situations where they have to have to come to you because they've been they've been screwed over so what what are the principles that a founder or an employer needs to keep in mind as they're structuring the compensation plan for sales on a high level and then I'll ask yeah 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 i mean at, at a real high that. level i mean it, it's all about respect and trust and transparency and not yep. looking to manipulate or take advantage of folks I mean, comp plans should not be have safety nets built in at the expense of reps that when you're not making a number, you can, you know, you know, claim, you know, claim a windfall clause or claim a territory switch or what have you to avoid paying out a deal to then take that money to the bottom line to then inflate your numbers to investors in your board. It's 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 you're, you're 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 it's it's a house of cards that you're playing with like that. So the first thing I would say is have basic trust, mutual respect, you know, and and be real with it. The second thing is that you really need to take a step back and ask a whole bunch of questions. 
So assess what is your desired outcome here? You know, what, what behavior are you trying to drive? You know, a lot of uh, founders make the mistake of not wanting to have complexity. And I agree, you don't want to have complexity for the sake of complexity, but you don't want to limit your opportunity and how you're motivating sales folks and driving revenue because you don't want to invest initially to put a system in place that will allow you to drive that desired behavior through the comp plan. Well, what's an um, example know, when you say complexity that some founders may want to avoid, but may actually be good for them? Oh, great. So, yeah, so I mean, I've, I've consulted with a number of folks in this area. So for, so for example, let's say that you have two or three different products that you're trying to sell. Okay. One is a legacy product, you know, low, low margin, you know, low hanging fruit, you know, basically yep. order taking. Then yep. another one is high margin, that high, high growth rate. That's the future of the business. Yeah. So I have seen organizations that are compensating reps the same for each one. So you need you need to incent the reps that they'll be paid more money for the harder sales that are more strategic, that have higher margin, that are driving your future business and differentiate that from the legacy products that it's basically order taking and requires very little effort. So you, you, you there needs to be that balance there. And, I, and I've seen, you know, instances where, you know, founders just didn't want to bother with it, didn't know how to do it, just took the easy way out and were shooting themselves in the foot and not happy with how how, how revenue was going, what that product mix looked like. And, and, and I blame them. I blame them for it, that, that you need to be able to uh, drive the behavior. I mean, the other thing, too, a way to do it is also to structure things in tiers. So as a founder, what you don't want to do is have sales folks come in who are slackers who are going to be gone in three months, who are going to yeah. get, who are getting big fat six figure base salaries. And then the one, the one or two sales that they're actually doing, yeah. they're getting a, a hell of a commission on it. On top of it, they haven't even earned enough to even cover their best base salary. Never mind getting a top notch commission there. So yeah. I like to set the, these comp plans up based on tiers. So, you know, if you've got a base salary, you know, you know, make them earn back a good chunk of that base salary before they start getting highly lucrative accelerators to, you know, blow out the commission. So I, I like a, sort of like a three or four tier plan where, you know, you got to make the rep earn maybe the first 25% of quota at almost a mm -hmm. below market rate to see what type of performance they're doing. And then once they get out of that, then it kind of goes to a more even rate. And then the accelerators, you know, once you get up into the high end, I, I want to see an uncapped plan where the, the rep has the opportunity to make you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. But of course, the company is going to make eight to nine times more of that than that each time. There's yeah. a way that everyone can win. The problem is, is that when executives start to, you know, let, let ego get involved and, and they say, you know what, you know, this is my business. I'm the founder. I created this thing. There's no way in hell that I'm letting this lowly sales rep make more money than I am. And yeah. now they start going back on the plan. And they start changing it. They start invoking clauses and they start losing trust in the sales team. And they shoot themselves in the foot because of their ego and selfishness. Well, so they're looking at the cash payout as something comparative to them, not realizing that, hey, you've got 100% or 80 or 50% of the equity in that company, whatever that may be, which that owner does not, which that sales rep does not have. So, doesn't matter what you're paying them in cash. It's it's peanuts compared to what you what you're accruing. And oh, by the way, he's or she is expanding or increasing the value of the asset that you've got an equity stake in. Right? I, I was I was about to interrupt you and say that, but I, I have a bad habit of, of interrupting people. I would argue that if I am a rep. And I just yep. closed a five hundred thousand dollar deal at an early stage startup. I just added five million dollars to the enterprise value of the company that you own all of the equity for. And yep. you're worried about paying me out a fifty thousand dollar commission on that? <laughs> I mean, literally, <laughs> literally. So our, our, our minds were thinking alike on that one for sure. I'll tell you that. Uh, literally, yeah, it's it, it, it's a matter of perspective. So one of the things when I'm working with founders and owners and we're talking one-to-one -one and they're in situations where that temptation is there to, to change the sales sales compensation for whatever reason. And one of the things I think about is when you're establishing that sales compensation, 
up front, the advice I just try to pour into my clients is make this a, an attractive, generous compensation plan. And at the same time, run the numbers of that sales rep crushing it. Like they do everything they're supposed to do. They crush it. They create some windfalls and things like that that you may be tempted to take away down the road. Can you feel good about that now? So that when that does happen, and hey, by the way, we're still working together, I will remind you what you said about that, that you will still feel good because you have the proper perspective. Is that is that something that you would share or how would you help that founder get in the right mindset yeah. of getting that comp plan right up front. Yeah. I mean, the comp plan, you know, th there needs to be stronger laws federally around variable compensation. There, there are strong laws for base compensation. Um, what I'm finding isn't so much the, the, the number itself as a whole, like, yep. like if a rep sold 20 hundred thousand dollar deals, there probably wouldn't be an issue. And that's $2 million that they did. The mm -hmm. company would be happy to pay that. If the right. rep sold one $2 million deal, the company doesn't want to pay it. Really? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, it's sad to say, and I'm ashamed to even suggesting this, but what I've seen so much is that you're almost better off keeping your head below the waterline. Go ahead and do those twenty hundred thousand dollars deals because you're not going to get be, be bothered. They're not going to come and steal that from you. But when you do that one big two million dollar deal, it's on everyone's radar. They're all watching it, and ultimately they're going to say, "Hey, you know, we're we're struggling over here in these other areas. Why the hell are we going to pay this guy a two hundred thousand dollar commission check?" So, oh, let's go look at our comp plan. Oh, well, look, there's some small print in the back that says that we can change the plan anytime we want, with or without notice, for any reason. Why don't we invoke that? Pay the guy. 40 grand of the 200 and we'll take the 160 and throw it to the bottom line. And now we all make our quarterly bo performance bonuses. Wow. That happens all the time. Really? That's why all the tech, th th that's why I have worked with a hundred top performing reps who have lost 50 to a hundred thousand to a million dollars in commissions. And if you were to talk to the founders, how could you get them in the, right mindset of hey folks don't do this 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 may happen you may get this huge deal you will be tempted how what are some checks and balances they can put into the if they're acting in good faith that they would put in the comp plan that wouldn't necessarily you know handcuff the company itself because sometimes you got to make changes depending on economic conditions but in general, what can they do to handcuff themselves to not be rash? Because the problem with 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 it, you know, and with with it being a smaller company is as as a founder, you don't have a ton of accountability. You can just kind of wake up one day and go, I want to make this change. You have that. I mean, power. I call it yeah, I call it short term thinking over long term thinking. Are you building a business that's going to be sustainable for the long run? Or are you yep. putting together a facade to trick investors and boards that things are going well? You yeah. know, I mean, that, 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 that's the bottom line is that you need to be real with yourself. You know, if yep. you're going to put together a comp plan this, for your salespeople, they're earning 50% of their income off their variable compensation. You know, to, to, if you're going to publish a plan, you're going to destroy your culture and trust if you go back on it. Mm -hmm. The rep can't go, the, the rep can't change the plan. Put together this and they want to make it seem like it's a legal binding agreement when in reality right. it's not. They'll even tell yeah. the rep that they have to sign the plan in order to get earned commission that they previously earned on a prior deal from a prior quarter. So, you know, if you're going to give this perception that it's a legal binding contract, if, if you're going to hold the rep to it, then make it a two-way street and you honor the agreement as well. And mm -hmm. like you said, I think it was a fabulous idea. Run different scenarios about, yeah. you know, if this happens, if that happens, how much will the rep get paid? I mean, you can't sit there and dangle the carrot in front of them. And then just as they're approaching it, pull it away. And that's exactly what happens when you change a comp plan mid-year. And the worst thing is, is when you're delaying the comp plan from being published. So, you know, we, we, you know we're, now we're in year two, okay? 
your, your reps are working on deals that they had previously that were that, that, that they're going to close in the current year. You're now three months into the year and you still haven't published the comp plan. All yeah. the rep has to work off of is the prior comp plan. Yep. And now, and now I see a lot of companies that are purposely delaying publishing the plan to see how some of these large deals shake out and then adjusting the, the plan after the fact. That's like a retroactive comp plan change, which is basically yeah. stealing. So you got to be honest. You got to be truthful. You got to respect your people. You got to worry more about long term than short term. Think about the culture. Think about the trust that you're building up. Okay. Think about just doing what's right. Show yeah. some decency and humanity and put yourselves in the shoes of those employees. Yeah. I mean, they'll go to bat for you. They'll go through a wall for you. You know, earn their trust. Don't demand it. You know, that's that, those are some suggestions that I'd offer at a high level. Now, suppose, I mean, put on your wartime general hat here. For whatever reason, something happens, say like COVID, some sort of either event or market dynamic that is creating some real market pressures on the company. And you're the founder. You want to keep as many of your team as you can. You know, you, you, you truly have your team's best interest in mind, but in order to keep them, you may need to make adjustments, whether it's short term or whatever you need to do. Sometimes it may be, Hey, we've been paying once we've sent the invoice, you know, and we build or, you know, what if we made the adjustment to do it when we've collected the money or just different things that aren't great for the sales rep, but in order to preserve the company and preserve jobs, you're having to do different things. How would you help a founder navigate a situation like that while maintaining the ethical approach to it, the good intent of trust and having to make decisions that they don't want to make and it, it, it can hurt the sales rep? It's a, it's a really How great you question you're bringing up here. Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Ultimately, I mean, the, the biggest frustration I see in working with clients in these situations is just the lack of transparency and communication, that these mm -hmm. decisions are being made without the involvement of the rep who it's impacting. That I, I have seen many scenarios where they just terminated the rep, where the rep may have been willing to take 50% of the commission and stay on. And yeah. not that I would recommend that because they're likely just going to do it again. Right. But I mean... You know, if, if you can show, explain to the rep why this is happening, why it's necessary, be proactive and communicate with them, and then mm -hmm. offer up some alternatives, you know, to, 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 to throw, throw a carrot at the rep. You know, maybe, right. it, maybe it's an equity grant uh, to offset the amount of commission loss. You know, you know, maybe, maybe it's, you know, better territory or leads, um, you know, you know, whatever it is, you know, it's just, what I see is that these decisions are being made with no communication. They're being jammed down the rep's throat. There's, there's, there's no transparency around it and it, and it's wrong. You know, as far as, I mean, you did mention one thing about going from maybe paying on bookings or invoicing to collections. Yeah. That is, that, that is one thing that personally bothers me. Because ultimately, yeah. what you're doing here is that you're you're fulfilling your company's working capital needs on the backs of the reps. So, sales so, reps, or, yeah. so you're, you're taking the money out of their bank accounts to pay their bills and yeah. keeping it in yours to pay your own. And, and that's for after they've worked these deals off of your plan that you published in the first place. So you should never yeah. make that change mid-year. And if you were going to change it you know, from year to year, you know, if I were an existing rep, you know, I, I'm now being delayed significantly getting paid. You know, also I, I, when they make changes from monthly to quarterly, I mean, you sell yep. a deal on January 2nd, you might not get paid until May 2nd. And now that's 50% of your compensation. So I think that there are certain things that companies can and should do when times get tough, but they need to be fair and equitable and reasonable about it. And frankly, I think leadership make, should be making sacrifices just like they're asking their employees to do, and they should publicize those sacrifices that they're making. But in, instead, it's a dual class system that is run, and what's good for one is not good for the other. But I, I do want to tell you, I since I've been posting on LinkedIn, 
I probably had a dozen different leaderships, folks, people in leadership at companies, reach out to me and ask yeah. me how to terminate somebody. Ask me about helping yeah. them put together a comp plan. I've posted about it a few times. It, it's been it's been wild. It's been amazing. That, you know, people want. You know, how, I, I got a sixty year old employee who's been here for ten years. We should have let him go a year and a half ago. It's a delicate situation. How do I go about doing it the right way so that we all feel good about it and he does? I was blown yeah. away when I got that. Somebody reached out and 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 and, and, and asked to jump on a call and uh, provide that guidance. So I mean, me posting every day out here from the employee's perspective is being yeah. listened to and heard and impacting the employer as they're doing things. Yeah. I want to reinforce that to our audience. Y'all, if you have questions about how to set up your compensation plan for success, or if you've got to change it, or if you've got to terminate a rep, reach out to Dan because he's, he, he's, got the experience, the expertise in that arena. And he's, he sees it from the employee's perspective. How can you minimize that impact? And quite frankly, have fewer negative glass door write-ups because you, you treated that employee with dignity and respect is something I want Let me to jump into this for one second, Sean. I, I do want to share with the audience, especially some of the founders out there, yeah. that the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, in February of 2023, passed a yeah. ruling that non-disparagement agreements are no longer allowed in severance offers, that yeah. severance does not buy your silence, that you have wow. every right to share your truthful experience. So if you think you can horribly treat employees and then throw some money at them and get away with it, that doesn't apply any longer. Even if they sign the severance, they are still entitled to share their truthful experience. So I think this is, uh, most people don't know about this. I'm, it's shocking that it's been around for 15, 16 months and people still don't know about it. I'm still seeing severance offers, every single one of them that have non-disparagement language in it. Uh, and then some of them vaguely refer to the NLRB ruling, but don't actually mention what it is, leaving the reader to think that there still is a non-disparagement in place. So it, it, it's in the best interest of the employer to treat the employee with respect, with dignity, with honesty, with transparency, as you yep. would want to be treated. That is the, they will be an advocate for you. They will be your best ally. They will remember, remember how you were treated and share with others and look fondly on their time here. The, the, the benefit to the organization is beyond measurable in this type of an instance. Completely agree. And I appreciate you sharing that. That, that is something... I didn't know. I imagine many of us, you know, uh, on this podcast didn't know about. So thank you for doing that. I want to harken back to what you were talking about with communication and something that came to mind to me, if you're thinking of a mental framework to have as a founder, if you're having to nab tough times and having to communicate change, God forbid that you have to do that. The, th the thought that came to mind is you owe it to the rep to give them the right of refusal, present their options to them, go, here's what we're thinking when we need to do. We want to keep you. We understand this is a change and it may be something that may not work for you and you may want to look somewhere else, but I want you to know this is what we want to try to make something work. This is what we can do. Let us know your thoughts. I just, I can't tell you how much I love that. I, 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 what, what, instead, what's happening is that these leaders want to rationalize it, don't want the yeah. confrontation, want to feel better about themselves. Yeah. They're literally gaslighting the rep about why they're being let go. They're claiming yeah. it's for performance. It's claiming because they didn't do, they made a clerical error that no one would ever be terminated for. You know, whatever it is, you know, they're claiming that it's a personality issue or whatever it is. And it's it, it's rarely ever the case. It's just that they don't want to be honest and say, hey, we're having a tough time. Hey, we overhired here. You know, let, we these are our choices that we have to make now. We're falling on the sword. We're taking responsibility and accountability for the situation that we're in rather than blaming the individual employee for the situation that the company is in. Yeah, it's the scapegoatism 
that they're looking at because they don't want to realize ultimately the condition of your company, what it's in right now, it's financial health. Yes, you have outside factors that are impacting you. But as the founder, that's on you. It has to be. And so taking that responsibility and then communicating, over-communicating with your sales team to provide them with options and letting them decide what direction. Because if they choose to stay on board, wow, that says a lot about them. It says a lot about you. And they did not feel forced into this situation. So they're going to they give a lot more of themselves. They feel like part of the solution instead of being blamed for the problem. Exactly right. Is yeah. there anything that we haven't talked about today that you think would be really important for founders to know about and setting up the comp plan, setting up these relationships with their sales reps for success? I mean, again, I think that the, the general theme and what I find everywhere, whether it's about comp plans or just employment in general, is, is intent, right? I mean, these comp plans, these PIPs, these stock equity grants, these severance offers, they're sort of presented as one way, but in yeah. reality, it's very different. And I think that if we just treated people with respect and transparency and honesty, and didn't have this view of trying to take advantage of or pulling a fast one over or denying mm -hmm. access to information to be able to make intelligent, informed decisions, that we would yeah. all be playing off of a different playing field and that there would be greater respect for each of us and employers wouldn't be looking to take advantage of and employees wouldn't be wondering if they're getting screwed and have all this anxiety and want to job hop from place to place. You know, it's this chicken and the egg argument that people want to make, but, you know, frankly, the employers are the ones who have the power. The employers are the ones who can hire and fire. They need to set the tone and do the right thing for themselves, for their companies and their employees. Awesome. Real quick before I let you go, what is the latest on the non-compete agreements? A few months ago, it said, hey, these things aren't going to be enforceable. But then I believe there was a stay on that. Wait, can can you provide the latest status on non compete Yeah, I and mean, the last thing that I heard was is that, you know, so the FTC, you know, banned non-compete agreements. Um, mm -hmm. They're doing so retroactively. So not just moving forward, but any existing ones. And that it's supposed to go into effect in September. It looks like it likely will be pushed out because there's a number of organizations that are contesting it, saying mm -hmm. that the FTC does not have standing to make that ruling. So I don't really care whether it's the FTC that does it or not. It's not what it's about. The argument isn't about whether the FTC had a right to do so. It's that there's a wrongdoing that has been in place in society for generations. And yep. it's about time these things changed. We've seen change in society in so many ways, you know, mm -hmm. with, with policing, with the Black Lives Matter movement, with the Me Too movement, with quiet quitting. It's yep. time that we hold leaders accountable for their actions and that, that 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 we force them to do the right thing, just as we have in other aspects of society. The the, the wrongful nature of it, the one sidedness, it, it needs to come to an end. You know, taking advantage of employees should not be a viable option for yeah. people who are running a business. And and I'm seeing that you know slowly but surely there are leaders that are stepping up, and they're not about you know taking advantage of folks because they were taken advantage of when they were younger. They're about mm -hmm. wanting to step up and do the right thing for everybody. And I, I am encouraged. There's a lot more that needs to happen, but there are many people that think that way as well. Awesome. Now, Dan, how can our audience get in touch with you? So my website is dangoodmanea.com. So Dan Goodman Employment Advisory, Dan Goodman EA. I'm on LinkedIn every day posting. Yes, I yeah. live in my LinkedIn DM box, uh, literally. It's where almost all my leads come through, yep. although we are getting a lot through the website right now as well. You know, reach out to me, go to my website, read my post. There's lots of information that I post every day that are beneficial to both employees and ways that employers can do things better. So that, you know, and then my email is dan at dangoodmanea.com and my LinkedIn profile, you'll be able to find me out there as well. Awesome. Well, Dan, thank you so much. This has just been a treasure trove of 
valuable information for us. So I really appreciate you investing your time to join us today. Thank you, Sean. I really appreciate the time. It was uh, fun chatting with you about this. A lot of topics that I'm obviously very passionate about, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share these views with everyone. Awesome. Thank you again. Thank <laughs> you.